All right, so if you have your Bible, uh, please open up to the Gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 27. If you're new here or you're just passing through and you don't have a Bible, don't stress about it. There's lots of Bibles in the backs of the chairs. Um, and also, uh, if you don't own a Bible, um, you can right now or afterwards out the doors and right to the right, there's the Bible shelf that you can take a Bible. You, uh, it's our gift to you. Um, anybody who doesn't have a Bible or even if you know somebody who doesn't have a Bible, you can take a Bible off that shelf. We always replenish it. Um, so we've had a, a little bit, we've been going through the book of Luke. We had a little bit of a break here for a little over a month. Uh, but we're going to dive back in today into the gospel according to Luke. And this is a very short passage, but it's one that I hope will be very uh, convicting and inspiring and encouraging for you. So I'll just, uh, just if you can remember, this passage takes place right after the last message we did here is where Jesus healed a paralytic guy and also he had healed a man with leprosy. So we're going to read starting, uh, pick it up, read starting in verse 27. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. So after, after he healed these guys, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And then leaving everything... He rose and he followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at a table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes, they grumbled at his disciples. They say, they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, He said, well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right, so um, before I start here, I just want to say a little something about how I prepare sermons. I think I've mentioned this before, how I prepare sermons every Sunday. I'm not going to talk about everything, but one of the things that I never do when preparing a message, I never prepare it with certain people in mind, just so you know that. I'm never thinking to myself, oh, you know, so-and-so might really need to hear this in our congregation, or that person's going through this and this in life, so I'm going to preach this passage or, or preach this theme. I don't do that ever. The closest I get to that is, say, when I'm preaching at Sunny Bray and I'm preaching to a kid's camp, I'll, I'll preach I'll speak to them age appropriate. Or, for example, this week at Moberly, we'll speak to them in, in, in kind of their scenario and age appropriate for the residents there as well. But even then, my main goal is just to follow a book in the Bible and to follow the scripture. And not what I think that particular people need to hear. Because, let's face it, it would be pretty arrogant of me to assume that I have all the best insight to make a schedule of what I think that uh, particular people need to hear from God about on any given Sunday. And so for me, that's one of the big benefits of preaching through the Bible, going through book by book and then following verse by verse and not skipping any parts, is that I don't rely on my own limited perception or discernment to decide on what I'm going to say on Sunday. Rather, it's God who decides. God's sovereign, and I'm not. And it really takes this, uh, it's actually an incredible burden off of me, knowing that if we were just, we just go and we just follow his word, week in and week out, that God's going to meet us here. That he's going to instruct us, He's going to convict us. He's going to meet us each where we're at with love and heal our brokenness and our wounds. And so most of the time, like I said, I like to follow verse by verse through the Bible. But I also, while doing that, rely very, very, very heavily on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, During the week and also on Sunday when I'm trying to discern how I'm going to present this passage, like, and, and just understanding it and how, what kind of things I'm going to say. And so, because oftentimes I have 
uh, people come up to me after the service and they'll, they'll ask me, how did you know this thing about my personal life? Or why did I tailor a sermon just for you? It's kind of embarrassing. So I've had people say that to me. And so you should know if you feel that way, that's not me. That's God. I didn't know your personal thing about your life, but he knew. And so this morning, if you feel like the words are like these arrows that are coming right at your heart and your life, please recognize that's God. And if you feel like that, you should pay attention because he's trying to get your attention. And so all this to say is I suspect that this morning is, might be one of those passages where some of you feel as though it's speaking directly to your heart. Now my uh, assessment as we go on here is that the vast majority of people in Revelstoke and the vast majority of people in Canada are really uncomfortable with the idea of going to church on Sunday morning. I would say that there's probably even a pretty good contingent of people here this morning who are also feel kind of just uncomfortable being here. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but one of the big ones is because most people think that church is basically a kind of club where the goody good people go. A place that accepts and welcomes religious people who don't do bad things. And most people are uncomfortable or get kind of stressed out going to a place where this might be the scenario. And many people are thinking in their minds, they're thinking, I can't go there. I don't meet the criteria of whatever it is they got going on for their club. I'm not religious, and I've done bad things. Lots of them. And church is not going to accept me. They're going to turn around and look at me, and Jesus is not going to accept me. And so I'm always trying to reassure people, yeah, we will accept you, and Jesus will accept you. The church is not supposed to be a place of judgment. But many say back to me, Jordan, you don't really actually know me. You should know me before you say that kind of thing. You don't know what I've done. I'm the furthest thing from a good Christian. My last year was pretty dark. Or my last week, or even, even last night. It wasn't good, Jordan. I'm addicted to some bad things, and I've been in a dark place. And so, whoever you are, I don't know if this is landing with anybody. If there's somebody here this morning, maybe there's somebody there on the live stream or in the Korean serv service. Maybe somebody needs to hear the content of this passage that says you are in the right place. Jesus seeks and calls and hang out with people who don't fit into the religious mold. That's in this passage. And the church is not supposed to be a club for the good and the religious. It's supposed to be more like a hospital where people with all their brokenness and their hurts can come. A place where people who find themselves in the, the dark and and dank areas of this world can go and find healing and hope and love. And so whoever you are, whatever kind of things you've done in life, whatever you're going through, please, I hope you can feel that, know that you are loved. And you're welcome here. I know the church has a history of not always practicing what it preaches. But that's my sincere hope, that you would be drawn to the love and hope and the heart of Jesus in this passage. I hope you can see it. Now I know that when I'm talking here about the church, if you read through the passage, the church is not explicitly mentioned at all in this passage. Instead, it's how Jesus welcomes and loves those in the dark places of life, the broken and the weary sinners. But we know elsewhere in the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says says, you are the body of Christ, Christians. And each one of you is part of it. Paul's talking to the church. This means the church 
As Jesus has ascended to heaven, we are the body of Christ. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 11, 11 says we are to be imitators of Christ and also imitators of God in Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, we should also welcome and love those who are in the darkest of dark places in life. So to help us understand this passage today, what I've kind of decided to do is I'm going to take a few principles from the, the, the Discovery Bible Study Method and apply them to this passage. So those of you who don't know, we have a few discovery Bible studies in our church. We go to a bunch of different groups and small groups and different kinds of studies. Um, Jen and I do discovery Bible study on Thursday nights, and there's a number of other ones as well, Sunday nights, and, and I think there's uh, um, the youth group, and, and then one during the week. But basically, discovery Bible study is just a little bit different. It's a way of doing Bible study that's not just simply intended to be kind of like just learning, just an information download. Instead, the purpose of it is more like a disciple-making process, part of a disciple-making process. In in Discovery Bible Study, I'll call it DBS for short, disciples are being made as they themselves learn the truths about God, not just by being told, but by their own discovery, their own investigation. And so DBS, it operates, some people, big word, hermeneutic, but it's way of looking at the Bible, seeing the Bible, interpreting Bible, not as we've often heard, as a big instruction manual, but instead seeing the Bible as God's divine revelation. Kind of like a divine letter. The whole Bible is like this letter to us, which reveals to us as we go through the whole thing, it reveals God's will and his character, and his mission. And so to find out God's will, and we look at this passage today, if we take these kind of principle, to find out God's will and his character and mission in this passage, and how it relates to us, the first thing that we're going to do is retell the story. <laughs> so if you're in our Discovery Bible study or in your one, this is going to sound really familiar to you, but I'm not going to do it quite how we do it in the Bible study because I'm preaching. But uh, in these verse, uh, what I'm going to do is retell this. So it's very simple, very small passage. I'm going to go through it again. So in this passage, we see that there's Jesus, right? He's just healed some guys. He's going along. Very briefly, we just see this. And he sees this tax collector named Levi. So if you were to read the same story in the book of Matthew, you would see that he's called Matthew. And does Levi, Matthew, that can sometimes be a little bit confusing to us. But this was very common back then. This is part of the culture for Jews living uh, in, 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 the, in, in the world then, is they both had a Hebrew name, Levi, but then they would also have um, a Greek name as well, and sometimes even Latin. In this case, it's Matthew. And so people have two names. So Levi, he's, he's a tax collector, We've talked about tax collectors many times before, but in short, back then, everybody hated tax collectors. People hate them now, but really hated them back then. Jewish tax collectors were generally assumed to be dishonest swindlers. If you're a tax collector, that's just what you were. And they were the face of somebody. If you saw a tax collector, they're the face of the Roman Empire. And they're a Jew. There's somebody who, who takes the taxes from you. And it was said that they would often charge extra so that they could pocket the rest for themselves. And they were considered by Jewish people to be traitors who sold their souls to the Romans for a lucrative career. So no one likes taxes, right? You guys love taxes? (laughs) No one likes taxes. But when you look back then, especially not from a government who is violently oppressing you, and super corrupt. I mean, all governments are corrupt, but one that's violently coming around and you have the bruises, you know, from the butt end of spears and things that uh, people are coming around every day. And in fact, so, so tax collectors, they're hated. They were hated. And so Jesus comes up to Levi. He's sitting in his tax booth and Jesus simply says, hey, Levi, follow me. Strangely, Levi gets up. 
And he leaves his post, he leaves his place of work in the middle of the day, and Luke says he leaves everything and follows Jesus. The next scene, we see Levi. You know, you have to kind of like see things, what must have been going on between the lines. Levi, quite obviously, filled with joy because he's so thrilled and excited that Jesus called him, that not only does he invite Jesus over to his place, but he invites all him and all his tax collector buddies and a bunch of other unsavory people as well. And it says that he makes, in verse 29, it says he makes a great feast, or the NIV says a great banquet for Jesus. And so, so far as we're retelling this, this whole scenario is really fascinating. I know we've heard it before, but... All Jesus said to Levi is, follow me. Levi's response is to leave everything that he's worked towards in this life and throw Jesus a massive party. Now, in the midst of this, as we retell it, there's some Pharisees and there's scribes. Basically, these guys are the the righteous in their own eyes, judgmental religious leaders of the day. And we know, when you read the rest of the Gospels, that they don't like Jesus at all. They don't see him as hope. They see him as a threat to their control. They've been using, it's horrible, they've been using their position of as a religious leader for control. And so them never missing the opportunities, they never miss opportunities to get other people against Jesus, they come up to Jesus' disciples, it says, which I find interesting. They didn't even have the guts to to say this to Jesus' face. And they go to the disciples, and in their self-righteousness, as they grumble, and they say, hey, why are you guys in Jesus eating with these tax collectors and sinners? To which, presumably, Jesus overheard, and he's like, oh, and he turns directly to their face and he says, he says, because the healthy and the righteous have no need for me. He's like, I came for those who are sick, the unrighteous. So before we go on, this, this might feel a little bit cryptic to you, but it's also kind of obvious at the same time. We know very clearly across the whole Bible Bible, that no one is righteous. Psalm 143.2, you can look these up later. 1 John 1.8 and Romans 3.10, we know this one. There's no one righteous, not even one. So when Jesus says, those people who are healthy have no need of a doctor, you know, he's like, I haven't come to call the righteous, those people who have no need of a doctor, The statement he's making, it isn't false. Because if there was anyone who was truly righteous, they wouldn't need Jesus. Because they would be sin-free. If somebody was sin-free, they would have no need for forgiveness. They would be holy like God. But the reality is, is that apart, apart from Jesus, you know, apart from Jesus who is God, that there's no one on this earth who has ever lived who is sin-free. And so you think about this. If any of these Pharisees were listening to Jesus and he says, oh, if you're healthy, you don't need a doctor. And they're like, oh, good. I don't have to listen to Jesus because I'm righteous. I'm not sick. All that would do if somebody reacted like that was prove the Pharisees' seriousness of their sickness. It would prove their self-righteous arrogance. Before Jesus. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And so the truth about you and I and every single person that we meet in this life is that we're all broken. Right? We all put on a good face, but we all have brokenness and we all hurt. And we're all sick. And we all need a healer. We need somebody to rescue us from the dark. A divine doctor. And so we looked at this passage. I've I've quickly retold it. 
one of the next things that we do in Discovery Bible Study is we ask some questions to the passage. First, we ask questions about God, and then we ask questions about people. So first of all, God. Right? That's an interesting thing when you go through the, the, the uh, Gospels. You see Jesus. If Jesus is God, then what about Jesus in this story shows you what God is like? I'm going to repeat that again. If Jesus is God, what about Jesus in this story shows you what God is like? What is his character, his will, and his mission? So first of all, there's, you read through the Bible, there's so much about the character of God in the Bible. But if we narrow down to this passage, I would say for sure we could deduce a few things. Number one is that God knows you. God knows you. He knows everything about you. And this story, it doesn't explicitly do this, but the story is so short, it doesn't elaborate, it doesn't give us big backstory or anything that, like that. All we know is that Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, he's just sitting there, he's just doing his job, collecting taxes. And probably he's an expert at hiding his hurts. An expert at hiding his brokenness and even his sin. And hiding it all from all the people that he sees every day. And we know what that feels like, right? <laughs> in Canada, in our culture especially, we're extraordinary experts at hiding all the junk. We hide it. Heaven forbid that anyone would ever find out what we're really like. That we're not as strong as everybody thinks we are. Or that we have these, some dark corners. Darker than anyone could imagine. But we see Jesus come along and we see that he knows Levi. He knows his hurts and his heart. And we can deduce this because of the fact that the calling of Levi is not random. It's not just some random time that Jesus is going and calling a bunch of people and seeing who would respond. I believe it's at the exact, exact moment, right moment of his life. That whatever Levi was going through, the exact moment where he would be receptive and he would just say yes to the king. Jesus knew his heart. And whatever it was about Jesus as he approached, we get the sense that Matthew knew that Jesus knew him. And we can, between the lines, I guess we can see... You can imagine Levi's thought as he says yes to Jesus, saying, that's him. Jesus says, follow me. He says, that's him. If there's one person in life that I drop everything to follow, it's him. So Jesus knew Matthew, and he, he knows you. And, you know, I wonder maybe for somebody here today, somebody online, Maybe you feel this, that everything in your life, every event in your life has been God guiding you to this moment, today. Second thing I think we could say about the character of Jesus is that he cares. Jesus cares for Matthew, and he cares for you. Right? Jesus didn't have to come to this earth. He didn't have to walk down that street, past the tax booth that day, and call Matthew. And then later, he didn't have to go to the cross. And he didn't have to suffer. And 2,000 years later, Jesus really doesn't have to meet you in his spirit while you sit in your seat right now. Or at home. He doesn't have to, but he is meeting you because he loves you and he cares about you. Even if you don't love him back yet, I always say yet. That's what we're all like. We're somebody who will love Jesus. Jesus is calling you 
and he knows you, and he cares about you. That's his character. And then his mission is to call you. His mission is to call you, and his will is that you would respond, that you would repent. Jesus says this. He says, he says I've not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners, the broken, to repentance. Jesus called Matthew to be his disciple. Who is Jesus calling today? I am 100% certain that if you are here today, it is correct to say that Jesus is calling, and then you insert your name there. He's calling you. He's calling you to turn, to repent, to turn. And he's calling us not just to like religion. Jesus calls us to a life of adventure, of following him. It's not boring. To a life that's lived for things that the Bible says angels marvel at and they long to look into. The angels are like, whoa, Jesus is calling that guy. Jesus is calling Jordan to do what? Is he crazy? Thankfully, Jesus doesn't rely on anything to do with me or anything to do with us. A life following the King of Kings as friends of the King. What an awesome thing. And so this leads us to the next Discovery Bible question. We've looked at God. Now, where do you see people? Where do you see yourself in this passage? Where do you see yourself? So we know Jesus knows you. He loves you. He's calling you. And his will is that you should repent. That means to turn, right? Simply to turn from whatever it is and go to Jesus. So like, look at, look at uh, Levi in this passage. There he is, right? Day in, day out, sitting in this little tax collector booth. He's a traitor. He's probably cheating people of their money. And he's probably justifying it. He's probably sitting there like, well, they all hate me. They, nobody likes me. They're all jerks. Why not cheat them? They were mean to me first. Why not get something from this miserable life? And then one day, in a moment of time, planned before the creation of the world, the words of Jesus pierce through all the garbage of the world. And he says, it's time to follow me now. And what does Levi do? He does it. The NIV says it like this. It says, Levi got up. He got up and he left the booth. So how about you? Have you left the booth yet? Well, what? What is your tax booth? I think we think about that. What is our tax booth? What is it? What are the things that you think are so important that you would rather stay inside your booth than be free? Jesus is calling you. What's chaining you to the booth? When Jesus says, Follow me, what's the reason behind the reason? Why you won't get up. John 8, 34, 36 says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son, the son of God sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus is a chain breaker. And if Jesus says, follow me, you can leave the tax booth. You can leave your brokenness and the darkness because it does not own you. Who are you in this passage? Are you Levi, a broken tax collector, just this guy is as broken, a sinner, so thankful that Jesus has called him and saved him? 
So thankful that he calls all his unsavory buddies in hopes that they could meet Jesus too. Are you, are you so happy that you met Jesus that you throw massive banquets? Like, are you so happy that all your time and effort that used to be for yourself and for your comforts now for him and his glory? Or, when you think about who do you see yourself in this passage, are you, do you see yourself as one of the Pharisees? By the way, no one wants to be seen as a Pharisee. <laughs> but maybe in the church, we sometimes don't see the plank in our own eye. Are we sometimes like the Pharisees? We see others in this world, we see things on TV, or we see others and we go in our town or other towns or whatever, and we kind of just look a little bit downwards at them, think, well, at least I'm not like him or her. At least I'm not like them. This passage is like news for all of us who have ever thought that. The news is you are like them. We all are. We're all in the same boat. The only difference between a Pharisee and tax-collecting sinners is that the Pharisee's too arrogant to see himself for what he actually is. And the only difference between someone who will spend eternity in glory, in heaven with Jesus, and the difference between that person and someone who will spend eternity in hopeless darkness without Jesus... The only difference between those people is not, is not, oh, how righteous they acted in life. The difference is this. It's Jesus. Did somebody say yes? Or did they say no? That's the difference. And so, Instead of ever, ever looking at someone and thinking, well, at least I'm not like them. At least I'm not like that guy. you got to look at them with the heart and care of Jesus. Care about them. And invite them to the great banquet. That's a whole other thing. There's lots in the Bible that's interesting about this banquet here. You could go on a rabbit trail. That's what for... Uh, going down and discovering these things in, in Warren and, and uh, Wally's group is. Go investigate the brank, great banquets of the Bible and see what you find. But as we close, the last thing that we do in, in a discovery Bible study form, format is we spend just a couple minutes quiet, thinking about the passage and then praying to God just on our own. If you ever wonder about Discovery Bible, say, I want to talk about all my stuff. You don't have to. You just be quiet and talk about it with God. In your heart, pray to God. We're going to do this in a second and say, I just saw this in this passage. Now that I can see a little bit of what you're like, I can see your heart, Jesus, and your will and your mission. And also, now that I can see myself somewhere, landing somewhere in this passage, God, what do you want me to do about that today? What do you want me to do about it? And so I'm going to give you a few moments to pray, to think, pray to God. In light of this passage, God, what should I do? What should be my action? Listening is no good if we don't actually employ it into our, our lives. We think, have I, have I responded to the call of Jesus? Have I left the tax booth? Am I like the broken tax collector? Or maybe I'm like the Pharisee? God, how do you want me to respond to this today, this week? And also, who should I invite to the great banquet? Who should I introduce to Jesus? When God brings something to your mind, I would encourage you to pray back to him, I will do it. Yes, God, I will do it this week. So I'm just going to give you like a couple minutes to be quiet, have your own kind of time with God 
if you're new and it's uncomfortable, whatever, you know, nobody's going to be looking at anybody. And then I'll close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your, your word and for this story about you and about what you're like. I thank you so much that, you're, that you and your will for the church, it's not about measuring up. about grace and being called to something so awesome and to be called to invite you into our lives to be changed we thank you God that you care about us that you know us and that you care about us and that at the cross you have dealt with evil and that one day it will all be gone for good. I pray, Lord, that you would help us all, every single one of us in here, Lord, whatever it is that you spoke to us to this day. Help us not to be like the acres and the ages and thousands of years of people, even God's people, the Jewish people, who had stiff necks and they resisted you. Help us to have soft hearts. And help us to have courage to just say yes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team.